This story starts, ladies and gentlemen, in a small aquarium shop on Smithdown Road. The shop was owned by Lawrence Fishbourne, who over the years had gathered the finest collection of aquatic life in all of Liverpool. From simple goldfish to royal tangs and clownfish, now sadly overfished to near extinction because of a certain anthropomorphic animated adventure film. Remember Shark Tale? You're the only one that does. But it was not a normal day in Lawrence Fishbourne's aquarium. Oh no. Things were about to get fishy. Fishier. I mean, it was an aquarium. Lawrence had just finished tipping a multi-pack of skittles into the rainbow fish tank when the shop's ship's bell rang, denoting that a customer had arrived. Lawrence laid down the packet and strode through the long showroom to the front of the shop. As he passed his ranks of wiggling merchandise, he suddenly caught the eye of a prized Ryukin goldfish. The normal opening and closing of its mouth seemed to have changed to mouthed words of ominous warning. No. 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 He felt a shiver up his spine, noticed that his back was wet, and inwardly reminded himself to repair the tank on the top shelf. As Lawrence walked behind the counter, there was a strange man looking at the tanks in the atrium. I'm after some tang, said the man. You've come to the wrong place, said Lawrence. The Thai massage parlor is three doors down. My mistake, said the man, who brought his hands down his long grey mac, which was unusually tied with a dressing gown cord, worryingly worn from rapid closing and unclosing. Lawrence gritted his eyes as the man produced from the folds a large, wrinkled package, which he carefully placed upon the counter. Lawrence hoped that he had washed his hands. As quickly as that, the man turned and left. Lawrence stared, confused at the package that had remained on the counter. As his eyes were locked on the brown paper object, he felt a dark, familiar dread welling up inside of him, consuming his thoughts. Had Lawrence been more observant, he might have noticed the strange man hitting his two-foot dorsal fin on the door lintel on the way out. Curious. Lawrence opened the package to reveal a simple wooden chest, the symbol of a large black fish leaping from the carved wood, its gummy maw stretched into a grim grim, the symbol of the Marshman. Lawrence had first seen the symbol over 30 years ago, when his father, Sebastian Fishbourne, had told him of his ill-fated expedition to the heart of Mossley Hill. At that time, Mossley Hill was a steaming tangle of twisted mangrove swamp, but more recently has become a no less slime-filled suburbia for the useless and opulent droves of footballers, estate agents and doctors, one of the lesser-known casualties of deforestation. The expedition was heavily criticised when the crew had returned from their journey limbless and decapitated and dead which Sebastian insisted was the same state in which they had been hired. Only the expedition's captain had survived intact, but that's highly unlikely to be important later on. Lawrence turned the chest around in his hands, his fingers tracing the address burned into the woodwork. L-18. It might have been more accurate to describe it as Hell-18. The next day, Lawrence caught the bus out of town in pursuit of the mysterious address, the chest clutched to his other chest, the one between his arms. Finally, he stood outside his destination, the neon rune of the smiling fish shining down upon him. It was a cemetery for the denizens of the aquatic, charnel house to the crustacean, and sepulchre to the sea, which also sold chips and battered sausage. Taking a deep breath, Lawrence stepped through the doorway and into the chip shop. He brushed past the rotund man in gardening overalls, carrying out 40 chicken dinners and a deep-fried six-pack of toffee crisps, and took his place in the queue. Lawrence ordered a saveloy and rested the chest upon the stainless steel altar to wait, 
lightly tapping his fingers, in tune to the music playing around him. Mike Oldfield's tubular bells, a favorite of his since his parents' surprisingly amicable incarceration into an insane asylum. His gaze glanced around the room at the other customers, their large, pale eyes, shambling gait and gills, putting Lawrence in mind of that Kevin Costner film where there's no land and he drinks his own piss. The bodyguard. But as he looked closer at their meals, Lawrence had a terrible realization that this fishy situation was decidedly less fishy. For you see, ladies and gentlemen, the battered fish was battered man. The scampi were testes, and the savory cakes were most unsavory. The chips were still chips, though. And behind the counter, dressed in a blue and white apron, was a horror from beneath the waves, a devil of the seas. Green gills glistening, bulbous eyes unblinking, and webbed hands proffering Lawrence's Savoy, which was actually a fried face. Lawrence grabbed the chest and ran, his eyes darting back and forth as behind him the fish people pursued. They were everywhere, all over town. Clownfish entertained the minnows in schools, the punks wore fish hooks and fish nets, and even the young, upwardly mobile professionals were guppies. Lawrence dodged the street sharks lying in wait and fled as fast as he could into the darkness of Sefton Park. Hiding in the caves to catch his breath, he could see the silvery scales of his pursuers glisten in the moonlight as they stalked the surroundings, their gummy mouths picking up rocks and dropping them again in search of their quarry. Not willing to risk death by being gummed, Lawrence headed deeper into the caves until no natural light could be seen, and the sounds of rushing water drifted through the darkness, making him desperate for a piss. Lawrence held off, not trusting his aim in such poor lighting. If he was to die this day, it would not be with accidental piss on his sensible chinos. Perhaps the ominous blue light coming from the depths of the grotto would allow him to relieve himself without mishap. He knew he should go no further, but in these stories, they always do, especially when they're bursting for the toilet. Reaching the source of the phantasmal phosphorescence, Lawrence saw something that chilled his bones to the very core and made his need for the bathroom a moot point. A vast cavern, the size of a Tesco Metro, possibly an express, knee-deep in murky waters, and at its centre, a pit of pale, faintly luminescent balls, piled haphazardly atop on one another. But this was no wacky warehouse ball pool at a brewer's fair, for as Lawrence looked closer into the shadows, he saw the fish people, holding flippers and chanting ominously in cod Latin. These, then, were the spawning grounds of the marshmen, and to his terror, Lawrence was about to discover how his amphibious antagonists bred with man. The females finished laying the last of their eggs, and the chanting became louder, summoning a human man to the edge of the balcony high above, wearing nothing but a long grey mac. With great ceremony, he undid the cord, confirming his nakedness, and with ceremonial aplomb, plunged his hand into an ornate vessel crafted to the likeness of a great white shark's jagged moor. It was full of hand cream. The cavern grew silent as he drew his graciously moistened hand to his center and grasped. Soon, nothing could be heard but the slapping of flesh upon flesh, each crack reverberating around the cavern, his gnarled free hand grasping the side of the balcony as he reached the vinegar strokes. With a cry of what was presumably pain, the man arched his back, and a long silvery strand caught the light of the cave, splattering upon the eggs below. They pulsated, awkwardly, as the figure flicked the last of himself from his palms, and with rasping, wheezing lungs, lit up a cigarette, and pulled back his hood. I'll call, he said to the eggs, knowing that he wouldn't. Shouted Lawrence, his voice echoing because they were in a cave. 
Sebastian Fishbourne, for it was he, clicked his fingers, wiped his fingers, clicked his fingers again, and a unit of Japanese fighting fish, wearing samurai armor naturally, emerged from the shadows, grasping his son in their strong, powerful fins. Why, father? Why? shouted Lawrence, as he was dragged through the waters towards his parent. Simple, Lawrence. Happiness. Joy. When we first found the Marshman all those years ago, we were nothing. But they pitied us, and promised us immortality beneath the waves. And all they asked for in return was seamen. Which is to say we lured sailors to their deaths, and also seamen. Lawrence, listen to me. The human world, it's a mess. Life under the sea is better than anything they got up there. Just look at the world around you, right here on the ocean floor. Such wonderful things around you. What more is you looking for? Darling, it's better down where it's wetter under the sea. Sebastian Fishbourne's laughter echoed throughout the cavern as he took the chest from his son's grasp. Now, with the power of the chest, the marshmen will take the surface world for their own, said Sebastian. Today, Mossley Hill. Tomorrow, Wavertree. Allerton. The world. You forgot speak, father, hissed Lawrence in defiance. You may keep speak, Terranian, smirked Sebastian. And as he reveled in his victory, all hope seeming lost, a volley of steel-tipped death came from the shadows, bursting the heads of the Japanese fighting fish. The fish people began to snarl and froth at the mouth, their pale, bulbous eyes darting upwards to the figure silhouetted upon the balcony. I'm afraid that's quite out of the question, said Captain Birdseye. <laughs> Gunfire tore through the ranks of evil marshmen, lighting up the cave as a battalion of child soldiers rappled down from the stalagmites, and from the cave's entrance came John West, desperado, rough riding a bear, and charged at his watery quarry. You took your time, now let's blow these fish and go home, Lawrence shouted, grasping the fishmonger's hand as he regretted spoiling his quip with a double entendre. You betrayed your own kind, Lawrence! shouted Sebastian as the roof of the cavern began to shake itself apart and the stalagmites fell from the roof. You had sex with fish instead of picking me up from sports day and well within my rights. Lawrence flipped the V's at his pesquinophile father and with a roar of defiance from Miska, which was the name of John West's bear, the cavern collapsed, burying the marshmen and their eggs for eternity, or at least the foreseeable future of eternity because that's quite long. <laughs> Hours later, Lawrence Fishbourne stood on the banks of the River Jordan in Sefton Park, watching the sun rise on the surface world he had saved. Captain Birdseye stood at his side, sharing a victory fish finger sandwich. When he had first approached the captain, who had been hunting the marshman since his crew had been killed all those years ago, he had been sceptical of the plan but they had fallen for it. Hook, line, and completely. I'd be honored if you stayed with us, kid, said Captain Birdseye, puffing on his cigar. And I only choose the best for the captain's table. Thank you, Captain, but I can't. Yes, my father was evil, yes, but he was right. I am one of them. Lawrence Fishbourne, born of the fish. Without me, kid, They'll come after you. Youngs would make you dish of the day. Lawrence Fishbourne turned to look at the wise captain and smiled. Let him come. And again, regressing his choice of words, he dived gracefully into the water and was gone. Lawrence Fishbourne, the last of the marshmen of Mossley Hill, letting the world think him dead until he can find a way of controlling the raging fish spirit that dwells within him. And as for the chest, well, it was lost to time. A distant shadow of a memory of a dream of a fault, until it was featured on an episode of Flog It, and sold for 25 quid, far below its market value. 
fenn.